Hello everyone, welcome to our bonus episode for whatever this is. This week. What do you mean whatever this is? I don't know what number this is. It's, 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 it's nothing. This part of five episode 530, I guess. Main bit's coming later on in the week, but this is this is the midweek bonus podcast where finally we're going to be talking about Coronation Street from 2005 to 2009. It's been a long time coming this, hasn't it? Yes. Yes, it has. We uh, <laughs> I think it's been like six months, was it? I think it was December when we did the first half of the 2000s. So we've been just kind of slowly making our way through the, the many, many episodes that we cherry picked from this half of the decade um, to, to get to our final destination. Because when we started this way back in... Um, it was two and a half years ago, I think, we started watching the old DVDs. I think originally the plan was to get to this point by maybe the end of 2020, but we've taken our time. We've done a few more episodes what? than we thought we were going to do. Well, originally we were just doing the DVDs, weren't we? And, and, and then as, as we got into the maybe 70s or 80s, we started to um, supplement with, with other episodes. And I think the the rewatch as a whole is something that we need to discuss on its own for a, note, for a separate podcast, because there's probably... That's probably lots of good discussion there. So today we're just going to be focusing on 2005 to 2009. Um, so, I mean, what do you think has taken it so long? Are, are we... I, 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 so we, we had our kind of schedule, didn't we? Like, most weekends we'd watched a few episodes and maybe, like, Tuesday nights and Thursday nights when there wasn't Coronation Street we would watch a bit more. Was it just that there were a lot of episodes to do or was there not necessarily the motivation to, to watch it quite so much? What, what was your, How was your feeling about it, about this, this half of the decade? Well, I mean, we'd seen it when it was on. Mm-hmm. Um... It, you were adding lots of episodes in. Yeah. And my tolerance for watching lots of Coronation Street and talking about Coronation Street dwindles somewhat after a while. Yeah. I I, I think that, you know, for you, as we were getting into the 90s even, your, your passion for, for watching these old episodes was starting to wane a little bit. But I think that that was partly to do with when we were watching the old episodes... We were, it was like going back in time, wasn't it? We were watching a bit of history and it was something very different and new. But you're right, watching these episodes particularly, um, these were ones that we had all seen before. I mean, did, did they did they feel recent to you? Like, did, were many of these ones, were you like, I, I remember watching this episode or did they, you know, did they feel fairly new or, or, or what? It feels weird how long ago it felt because... Mm. I don't, like if you said to me, you know, 2000 and 2006, I'd say it wasn't, that wasn't that long ago, but actually it was. It was. Yeah, that and like it the was. Fa- the fashion and the technology and lots of different things about it feels like it seems much long, longer ago than I would imagine. And everyone looks so young too. There are quite a lot of characters in there who are in it now. And I would say, oh, you know, if you ask me, oh, I don't, don't think they've changed very much. But actually, <laughs> they really have. And okay. the, the fashion, bad. For See, women. I didn't know, bad. I wouldn't notice that kind of thing at all. I mean, the, what they were wearing there, I would say, well, that's exactly the same as what we're no, wearing now. I was now. watching it going, God, I would have worn that and it looks bloody awful. What sort of thing? Just, just like silly frou frou tops and ridiculous like asymmetrical hems and like just like lots of khaki. <laughs> so they're, 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 you're right. And that, also, um, lots of people with like weird, weirdly um, fake dark black raven hair. Mm. Whereas now I think that it, it it didn't stand out at the time, but now it just looks very very. This, artificial this was the era where we saw oh, both carla and say, michelle connor appearing on the street also wasn't it? the makeup too like frost you know frosted eyeshadow and like huge overlined lips and everything was like dark glossy lipstick and big dark eyeshadow and and i know that <laughs> these days there's you know you know uh contouring and lots of different things that are going to become quite dated pretty soon but Oh, just watching it, it's like, oh, this is not a good time. So funny. No, I, I wouldn't have noticed that at all. These fashions to me, were not to me it to felt just, it, it could have been plucked from, from yesterday, from some of it. I mean, it, it definitely felt more recent. And as I was watching some of the episodes, I was thinking, yes, I remember watching this, or I remember this story being on at the time. But equally, there are other things there where I was thinking, 
I think I only know about this from reading about it since doing the podcast. And I know I must have watched it at the time, but it's gone right out of my head. I think that this wasn't exactly a golden era for the show, was it? Um, and I, even, you know, we've been watching it over the past six months or so, looking over the notes that we made for the episodes that we watched back in, say, January time. I'm looking at them thinking... God, I, I can barely even remember watching them in January, let alone watch them back in 2006 or so. So maybe there was a, an element of forgettableness about them. But um, I think, you know, that one of the increasing issues that we ran into as we were watching, you know, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, was that, um, you know, that there were more episodes that were going on at the time. We've now left it in the era where there were five episodes a week I think I think we're on to the two episodes on Monday one on Wednesday or Thursday two on Friday now and even if we are watching more episodes each year there's still an awful lot we're not watching and maybe we're just watching the main highlight episodes and I think it was also in the post 2000s there were more attempts to um to grab the viewer's attention with dramatic stunts or, or murders or, or dark, salacious plots or whatever that were you know, just there to grab the, the, the viewers in for a short period. And, you know, it doesn't like feel like... Viewers. Yeah, and, and maybe that some of the things that we saw didn't feel like they had the, had the legs afterwards. It was there for an instant, like, whoa, moment. And then, you know, next episode we watched, they'd moved on and they were on to the next one, you know? Yeah. There, there were some overarching plots that, um, that that went on for a long period that we can talk about in a minute. But yeah, on the whole, the, 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 this period of rewatching for me felt very much like bam, bam, bam. But not very many of the bams were absolute monumental, volcanic, world-shattering bams, you know? It was like, oh, you know... Katie, Katie Harris has, has killed herself. Oh, no, that's dramatic. No, it, it, there's been bigger things happen on Coronation Street. And, you know, you just get in the sense that it's starting to be a bit of a, a scene, been there, done that. Do you think um, it's a victim it. of its own success in a, in a way? Would this be more interesting if it was a completely different show? I don't, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe. I mean, in, in some ways it did feel like a very different show because this was also yeah. an era when um, there was a real uh, revolving door of characters, wasn't there? I think for the whole of the 2000s, yes, you got your your long stays like your Kens, your, your Emily's, Deirdre's and all that, but also you got a whole glut of new characters that are in and out and I'm like thinking, oh yeah, I, I remember you know, the, the Kelly Crabtrees, I, I remember, um, <laughs> you know, the, the Mortons, the... the it's just that sort of thing but it feels like they were um they were of their time and then and then forgotten again just in for a few years and, and then out like i was saying with the story here for the big hits and then i don't know what to do with them now ship them off again you know um so it, it it was funny even when we got to 2009 although it feels kind of recent in some ways for me it does also feel like that's really surprisingly close to the start of the podcast because we began it in 2012. So where we just got to the end of 2009, we just saw, was it the Christmas episode, the last one that we saw? Yes. Um, that was when Sally revealed to oh, Kevin yes. that she had breast cancer. The breast cancer, cancer one. Yeah. And that to me has kind of been compartmentalised in my head in the, that belongs in the clip shows. Um, that's from... You know, the before lot, times. The, the before times of the podcast, but actually, it was only two and a half years since the beginning of the podcast. I, I'm almost like in a, a a BC AD situation with the podcast, like post podcast and pre podcast, and everything that's in the era of the podcast feels very very recent and now. And this is the this the era of the show that we've been analysing to high heaven, and everything else is just you know the, the before bits. So it's it's been a real kind of mixed feeling re-watching this but um yeah it, it on the whole I would say it's it's not necessarily a, a particularly classic era I'm trying to think of other other trends that there have been I mean um one thing that we 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 did run into a few times is and we probably mentioned this at the first half of the 2000s one we were there were lots a lot more two-parters weren't there and sometimes we would you know in the episodes that we'd had saved on our uh, to, to watch we had 
it, we, we switched it on and it was like, oh, this is just the second half of the first of a, of a two-parter and we've, we've missed a bit. And other ones, it's like, okay, let's let's settle down to watch an episode of Cory. Oh, it's, this is a two-parter. We've got to sit and watch it for 45 minutes. And yeah, I don't know. You just don't feel like you get the same immediate quick fix of, of retro historic enjoyment as we did back in the 60s and 70s episodes. Well, there's definitely a difference between those two-parters and the the, sh- the episodes that we have now where they are an hour long. But the difference is a lot more subtle than it is between the episodes that are broadcast half an hour apart mm. and the episodes we have now. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So how does it what how does it feel different to you? Well, it just feels like it was an extra long episode whereas I think now I don't know, is there a bit of if there is there a bit of a um a gap? I'm not sure. But two part it meant you're watching a, a very special episode, you know, something big's going to happen here. This is important. Pay attention. Whereas now it's a bit more run of the mill, you know, every episode's really a two parter. Yeah, but I, I, I think that even in this stage, they were still doing their two episodes on Monday, two episodes on Friday. I know. But, yeah, I, I guess... I don't I, think you get what I mean, never uh, mind. Never, never. Okay, so, um, it, it, we don't want to be too down on this era, because we're going to be talking about this for, you know, quite a while to come still this evening. Were there any, um, which, which stories for you, I mean, pick a storyline that we watched bits of that you, that stood out to you as being a real, you know, highlight of the era? Well, probably the one that people didn't like was the Mulvin storyline with Molly and Kevin. And that's still not resolved itself um, yet because we watched, like we said, the Christmas episode, which was when Kevin and Molly were going to run away together, but they didn't because just as Kevin was about to tell Sally that he couldn't be with her anymore, she revealed to him that she had breast cancer and she was scared. And suddenly everything kind of came into focus to Kevin and he realised that um, that this thing with, with Molly wasn't wasn't for keeps. And so he even saying... says he even says to her, Oh, grow up like all the all these plans that they had together, he kind of throws it back in her face and makes it seem like she was the one that came up with it because she's a silly kid. Mm. But actually he was the one that was acting immature because he's the one who's married with children. Mm. So are you saying that that was a highlight for you rewatching it? Did you did you like seeing that? I story quite enjoyed again? it. I mean, I, d- I didn't have the context of sort of being out because I knew it was going to happen. So I, I wasn't I get outraged. Exactly the same as you. Everybody was so outraged at the time when we yeah. had Kevin leaving Sally. I mean, the the golden couple, Kevin and Sally, who had already faced quite a, you know, adversity in the late nineties with the affair with with Natalie Horrocks. Now they're back together again, and now he's back to his old tricks. Um, yeah, it didn't jumping feel it, the bones of the local shop girl. Couldn't get offended by it because it's kind of like history. You know, it feels yeah. feels like going back and watching, um, watching, being able to watch history being made. So you don't feel like. You, being emotional about whether or not it should have happened or not feels very superfluous and ridiculous because, you know, whereas we're in it, when we're watching episodes now, even if we have a spoiler or we know something's going to happen or somebody's going to come back or someone's going to die, um, it feels like you can you can kind of be a bit more like, that's stupid, I don't agree with that or I wish this hadn't happened. Yeah. Because so, they only just this... needed to make us a little change recently. But you're right, looking back, I, I, I've quite enjoyed the Malvin stuff that we've, what little we've seen of it. Yeah. It's, it's quite, you know, it's, it's quite racy, juicy. isn't it? And juicy, <laughs> exactly. And I've just loved Auntie Pam in it, Pam Hobsworth. That, she's Brilliant. been in, she's been a new character, a new addition for this little era of the show, hasn't she? She's just, I don't know how to describe her. I don't know what it is about her that makes her so fun. She's, she's, she's the voice of reason. Yeah. And she's very down to earth, and um, but she's also a bit of a ducker and a diver, isn't she? Yeah, when one of the she's... scenes that I do you remember the one where she was in a pub with Tyrone selling watches or something, and and Kev, and, and Tyrone was her stooge, going, "What? What's that? You? Oh, I, I've heard that those watches are really great. And everybody yeah. wants those." She's like a con artist. Yeah, she was, but she, she's just she... completely. She doesn't care. She's almost like got no <laughs> no morals about it. She just wants to make a quick buck. Yeah. But but she does. She is the, the the kind and she she is she does have morals because she was so she she finds out about Kevin and Molly doesn't she and yeah. she's very um yeah, perturbed about that <laughs> but I, I've I've loved Auntie Pam but she's absolutely like many of the other characters of this era only really remembered now by 
the diehards, isn't she? Or, you know, the people that are like, really, like, oh, she's brilliant. A bit like Uncle Umed, because he, he was in this pit. I love era, him. Wasn't he? And, uh, and lots of people in... do love Uncle Umed, but he was in less than a year. I know, but he was in, he was in the Eternals, the Marvel um, film, which I thought was so funny. It's like Uncle Umed made good. After all of his schemes <laughs> and plans, he's finally infiltrated Hollywood. Yeah. Love him. I don't or... remember much about what he's even done. Did we even watch the doorbell episode? No, I, I don't, don't think, think so. we did. I don't think we that had was, that. That one. was like his, that was peak Umed. Yeah. So what's just, the doorbell reminding well, you? Well, it's just, you know, I can't even remember. It's just well, he's, he's just got a new doorbell really for the shop, hasn't he? That plays um, like the Carpenters, it. yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I, okay, he's just kind of, he's very funny and he's a, he's very stereotypically Indian shopkeeper, isn't he, I have to well, say. Well, he was like entrepreneurial, wasn't he? And he, he yeah. kind of eventually breaks down to Dev and say that he, he feels like he's done it his life wrong and that this was a do-over sort of thing. And mm. Um, yeah, and uh, I, yeah, I really enjoyed him. Mm. The other thing that we've seen, which is, I find interesting, because we're watching this with hindsight, is the beginning of Peter's alcoholism story. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible how far back it goes, isn't it? And this was really the beginning of it, because he'd returned in um, for the 40th yeah. episode in, in, in 2000. But yeah, just now we've started to see the, the very beginnings of it. Um, we obviously saw the AA episode, the AA meeting episode, which is always, you know, that's the ultimate clip show, isn't it? And that, that was just as funny. Even though we'd seen it all before, many times, we still laughed our socks off at that. But it's just interesting how insidious it has been. And I think that um, a lot of people complained about how long it took Peter to sort of get over it and end up being able to get his... Um, transplant and even now it's continuing and i i think that if you're going to take your hats off to to coronation street um it would be for some some long-running stories like this and it really is something that only soaps can do we're watching in real time a man descend into alcoholism and Mm. begin to ruin his life and dismantle his relationships and let people down day by day by day yeah and Corey and Soaps do not get credit for these kinds of stories but when you view them you know people have been watching him struggle with this so long that if you were born when he started you would be finishing university Mm. by the time that he's managed to sort of conquer his demons and it's still you know there's still always that question will he succumb Will he? Yeah, will he come back? Will right. he relapse? Yeah, will he fall Because he's done it before, again. and and I, I feel like it's brutal but honest, and I, I take my hat off to Corey and um, Chris Gascoigne for be a, being able to portray this character's journey. Mm. We saw for the twenty um, odd years. We've seen the drunken nativity episode, didn't we? Which was. Um, it was kind of it was just a bit tragic and it wasn't it yeah. stumbling in there and sort of pushing well, past yeah, because the because Simon was was Simon Joseph I, th- I think so yeah or a king or something but that's that's been the other thing with this storyline seeing poor Simon being rejected by his dad because Peter goes off for a bit doesn't he after the Shelley and Lucy story in the early 2000s and then he comes back in this period I think with Simon in tow so we've seen new new Alex Bain yeah. cute cute as a button isn't he oh, if so you... adorable I remember at the time thinking he was but he really was a, a little cutie yeah. if you have ever wondered why people speak of um, Simon fondly and you're just a, you know you've just started watching it and you think he's just an annoying oaf you really need to go back because Simon was a little angel, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And he had his little, his rabbit Leanne, didn't he? Sad. We, 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 it was sad because we saw the bookies catch on fire, which is, uh, was that Peter's fault? I can't remember how it, how it happened now. But um, yeah, poor poor Simon losing his rabbit there. But you're right, that, that's been a really interesting um, thing to see the start of that storyline. It was also, I found... One of my favourite bits of this era, which is another long-running story, was um, what happened post-Richard Hillman to the Platts. Particularly the, the start of Demon David. Because in the... I guess in the late... I can't remember when Jack P. Shepard sh- took over. I think it was in the early 2000s. Um, he was just kind of a bit cheeky, wasn't he? A, a, a lovable little scamp. But this, in the second half of the of the 2000s, is when we really saw him turn into the demon David and um, he was absolute. he's absolutely sublime to watch wasn't he yeah it was Just, really funny to watch him transform yeah seeing how dark he got 
Um, like you said, he was always cheeky, and I think that Simon, you know, not that they're too comparable because Simon's much younger than David um, when Jack P. Shepard took over, but there was always something, there was always a bit of an edge with David compared mm. to Simon. Simon's always been like a very, very, you know, wafy, kind of orphany, sad. Um, but very cute, you know, anyone would put him in their pocket and run away with him. Whereas mm. David was like quite edgy, even even as a little lad. Yeah, yeah. Cheeky, he was cheeky little... Um, really smart. Yes, yeah, sarcastic, smart. One, one of my favourites before he got really, really dark was the, uh, the Christmas 2006 episode where he causes chaos. Um, and it kind of all starts really, doesn't it? When he gets, finds Granny Ivy's diary in the attic. And that was kind of like his origin episode, story. Well, it's he... a bit like, it's a bit like Tom Riddle's diary. Yeah. Oh. And he, he invites Maureen to, uh, to Christmas lunch. Yes. Who was going out with Bill Webster yep. at the time. Bill's there currently dating Audrey and, and David just kind of sitting watching back and, and, watching it all burn and 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 that kind of that carries on doesn't it through like um sarah and jason's wedding the next year was incredible um the the bit where in the um before that where he's up on the roof pretending to shoot down at um that was sarah david uh, sarah audrey and gail and he's doing his three witches three bitches um, line because David is um, kind of lures Jason onto the factory roof. I, I think Jason thinks that he's going to top himself or something, um, and, and that that very deadpan, sinister is right um, monologue about how he could just very easily get a gun and off his family. It was so so chilling, and obviously a bit a bit different. Um, feels a bit different watching it now than um, then because there is a lot more sinister history of that sort of thing mm. occurring in real life yeah. and uh, the context of that didn't exist i think no and obviously if you're watching it in a different country it's going to feel a bit more um unpleasant than it yeah, would have done closer to us. home yeah. for some countries i guess the there's a school shooting kind of thing. Not not that it was a school shooting, but you know, no. there's just the the idea that this this kid with no remorse, no, almost if it's like he had no soul kind of thing, wasn't it? It really was, and it, yeah. And and I think one of my highlight episodes, one of my best episodes out of the whole of this period, was um, Sarah and Jason's second wedding episode, which starts with um, this moody music, doesn't it? And David's got a car somewhere he's he's off the beaten track somewhere um and he um he ends up driving into the canal just after leaving a message on the answer phone saying well you've done this to me ma'am or, or i can't remember whether you blame sarah just the whole family he just blames for his whole life turning out rubbish um and then yeah he drives into the canal the whole Sarah is determined to go through with this wedding and Jason's like, are you sure? We, we just heard your brother's driven into the canal. And she's like, no, he's trying to ruin it. He's trying to ruin it. This is exactly what it, what he's like. Then towards the end of the episode, he turns up again at number eight, doesn't he? Kind of looking all bedraggled, but, but so, so evil. Like, some, like yeah. some kind of monster from the swamp. And... Um, but he's so pleased with himself. He's, yeah, and, and everybody's like, "Oh, David, David, you're okay." And Sally and, and Sarah's going, "No, no, he's doing. It. He just wants to get the attention." And then when he's alone with Sarah Lou later, he just kind of gives this, this little smirk, just to say, "Yeah, I did I do this it. to yep. ruin the day." And yep. as they drive, as Sarah and There's Jason, nothing you can do about yeah, it. Yeah, Sarah and Jason drive off to go on honeymoon. At the end of the episode, he's staring there, smiling out of the window. He is. He could. He could be a horror. A horror uh, movie character, couldn't he? David in that era. Really? Honestly? He was so, so amazing. I, I loved it. We also had like, the David pushing the gale down the stairs the following year. Um, he, he's, he goes on the rampage, doesn't he? With his um, was that a baseball bat or a, a, um, a crowbar or something. Where he starts off at his house and he's kind of smashing up cars outside the garage. And then... Um, walks down the street, anyone gets in his way, he just kind of pushing out the way, smashing people's windows. Um, it was it was amazing. I mean, it's it's no wonder that um, so many people love David as their favorite, as one of their favorite ever characters. He was just um, 
Epic. The epic is right. You, you couldn't take your eyes off him on the screen and it just felt like anything that Coronation Street could throw at Jack P. Shepard at that time, he would take it in his stride and do an incredible performance. Um, it kind of, he kind of tones it down a little bit towards the end of the era, doesn't he? Because this is when um, Tina McIntyre comes along and then they sort of, and they start going out and uh, he's a little bit more of a family man. Did he, did he get, has he got his tattoo? Have we seen? I don't remember seeing that. I thought we, I thought we did see him get his tattoo. Oh. I thought, I think we did with his Tina tattoo. Um, and we also, and, and that story also involved the introduction of the Windass clan, didn't it? Who came in as a bit of mortal enemies of David and, and, and Joe McIntyre, played by Reese Dinsdale, Tina's dad. Um, yeah, I love that. And, and there was, there was the scene where, for, for a while, Gary's, I can't, is Gary chasing David or Gary stalking David or David stalking Gary? I think David's stalking Gary. Um, and then it kind of ends up with, um, David punching Gary and he says that Gary punched him first and Tina has to cover for him. Now. It really, really is. I mean, they're, <sighs> they're not enemies anymore, are they? No. But I, I just found it hilarious seeing the Windasses come in because they both, or the, him and, well, it was mostly him, Gary Windass, Mikey North, looked so, so different in the early days, <laughs> yes, didn't he? Like he, was, he was like horrible, greasy, you know, dirty... Um, yeah. Proper, proper chav. Whereas to look mm. at him now, he mm. he's got the uh, he's got a little bit swished up, hasn't he? Yeah. I also thought one thing I want to say about the um, uh, Reese Dinsdale coming in as um, Joe. Joe was that it was really interesting to see how Coronation Street was tackling this economic crisis that was going on with the recession that happened around two thousand and eight, I think, mm. and. Um, Joe is suffering because he is a builder and he's trying, finding it difficult to get work. He hurts his back. He starts being hooked on painkillers. He turns to crime. He um yeah that scene yeah, where he's increasingly desperate. Yeah, where he breaks into the medical center. That was a brilliant scene. He's there to he can see how desperate he is. Yeah, getting the getting the materials, getting the um what is it the the tools out of the out of his van to to break the uh, burglar alarm. Yeah, and he, he, he didn't know, you know, he, he just wanted the, the, the pills and mm. I thought he was a really fascinating character and the fact that Coronation Street was using his story to talk about, you know, the economic um, crisis that was going on then feels very easy to, uh, what's the word, sympathise with now as we're coming into another very tough yeah, time for lots of people. Era. Um, it feels like it's so sad that it's so recent though you know mm. just talking politically um, that you know within another 15 years we're co- coming into another time when Coronation Street really could do another story along these lines I, I am surprised that we haven't had a food bank story with Gemma and, and Chesney mm. they've got so many kids and it's you know tough again now mm. it's sad that that, that you know those stories well feel quite fresh yeah okay um so we've talked about um we've talked about Malvern we've talked about the Platts uh, what what's another story that stood out for you in this we talked about this Peter. era of oh, Peter as well yeah um we had Mel Hutch right that was that wasn't a big story but it was certainly a significant one because that was um the character who was played by in um in Ian McKellen, Mc- McKellen who yeah. is um a very, very famous actor. He played Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. And he's done other things, I think, as well, maybe. Mm. <laughs> but um, having having a big guest star like him on, on the show, I think... Um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword sometimes, because it feels like, on the one hand, it feels like pandering to people who don't take soap seriously. Like, look, we've got a real actor in the show. Whereas I think <laughs> that a lot of soap actors, I feel like, really deserve the same kind of kudos as... as some of the thesps, like, yeah, definitely. I like, mean, a lot yeah. of them couldn't do it. What what so pactors do, going day after day after day. Hmm. Um, I was kind of but looking, having him in it was actually amazing. It was, and I couldn't remember what I thought about it the first time round. And when when we came to watch, because I think we saw like two episodes of his. I think we saw the first and the last or something that he was in. Um, and I was going into it thinking this is going to feel like really tacky and cheesy or like 
cameo-ish, you know? Yeah. But I, I absolutely loved it. And he just camped it up to the max, didn't he? As um, Mel Hutchwright or, or Lionel Hipkiss, as it turned out he actually was. And seeing him taking in the likes of Norris and Rita and, and Emily and everything. It was it was just hilarious. And the, the, the lines that were written for him to be delivered in his theatrical kind of stylings were, um, were just a lot of fun. And um, I, I loved... I loved it, and then uh, when his... I think it's Ken who reveals his true identity at the end, that he's really... Because he, he said... I can't remember, what's the story he was... He said he was this really successful author, and he's he's come to Weatherfield to um, research a book yeah, and write about... Yeah, Yeah, for his... Was he writing the book called Hard Grinding, or was that the book that... That they, was the book he'd written. Yeah, yeah. And he wants money, he wants them to donate that's money. That's right, that's right. They all, so He tried to publisher. convince them to put money up front so that yeah. Yeah, so he could publish this new book. And then and he, he kind of locks himself away in the downstairs front parlour. Ah, he was typing away, wasn't he? Like, oh, but he wasn't actually doing anything, because he was... When he heard someone coming, he would like tap, 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 tap. Well, I, I thought that he was like oh. playing a tape player of, of oh, typing okay. sounds. I can't remember, but he just cons them. And um, his final scenes where he's there in the cafe just telling everybody, ah, oh, you, you've, you've outsmarted me well. And, and, and he kind of says, I'm going to write all, you all into my book and you're going to... He's going to make really nasty caricatures out of them all, like Ken the boring teacher and, the, and Fred <laughs> the buffoonish oaf and what, whatever. Uh, with Norris, the busy bozzy um, uh, corner shop uh, assistant. It, it was just, it was just a lot of fun it for was. the two episodes that we saw, and it, and it was it much was also, better than I was expecting. It was also fun to just to have, you know, we know that this is going to be a short story in in this, you know, long running soap, and we know that this is what happens, you know. The soap will have, a, you know, an A story for the year, the B story for the year, and then a few kind of like long running ones, and then lots of little tiny, you know, very small arcs. But because we knew that <laughs> we knew that um, Ian McKellen wasn't going to be in Coronation Street forever, we knew that it was a limited edition story, mm. and so it was really fun just to watch it as a a story that had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you knew that it was going to be confined mm. to a short space of time. Well, it was a little bit like the Lillian Spencer story, wasn't it? Yeah. About five years previously, where they brought in um, Maureen Lippman to play the new relief manager at the Rovers, um, just for a period while, <laughs> after Julie Goodyear quickly well, they scrambled departed. to yeah. patch And that it was up. just a nice, yeah, little mini story with a, with a well-respected um, thesp, and uh, doing doing an amazing because job. I just want to say it's not necessarily the fact that um, Ian McKellen is any any better than any other. Um, obviously, he he is amazing, but um, when a, as a special guest star gets treated with the same kind of reverence and respect that they gave this character, that Coronation Street can do really fun and interesting things. And I I can't think nothing particularly springs to mind, but. I do know that we have had short-lived characters who have really kind of um, vibed so well with the show and the writers and they've become more than you would expect a very short-term character to be. Mm. But because they knew that they were working with Ian McKellen, I think that they, they gave that character the more, of a, yeah, yeah. more of a presence than they might have done normally. Yeah. It's also, it reminds me as well of the, uh, the Peter Kay appearance. I think those two... Uh, often the ones that are mentioned on look here's a special oh, did guest you know? star did in you Coronation know that Street. Was in, was in yeah. Coronation and Street. it's not anything that I'd like them to do too regularly no I mean they did a, I suppose a slightly more recently where they had Paddy McGuinness in yeah. for a few episodes I was just thinking it's, of not, it's not quite the same thing is it well but, the thing is we I feel like especially you you're kind of primed to be hostile like like against the invaders who are coming in or especially if you're not particularly fussed one way or the other about the person who's going to be taking the role. Like, Ian McKellen, I think I'm definitely a fan of his. You not so much because you didn't, you fell asleep watching Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah. But like Peter Kay and uh, Paddy McGuinness, it feels like sometimes you feel a bit like, who do you think you are coming into my show? And, and mm. like, you think you're better than all these characters. So sometimes they've got a bit of an uphill struggle to win us over a little bit yeah i think that's what happened to les dennis too and i think that some people never got over it mm. because mm. we were like oh he's les dennis why, why is les dennis gonna be what he's not an actor he's a he's a presenter why is he being in in Corrie? but he completely won not that this is to do with this 
era, but he completely won us over, and I still love Les yeah, Dennis in Corrie. Yeah, the, uh, the, the Mel Hertwright story was uh, just a perfect marriage of a, of a celebrity guest, nice little couple of week long storyline. And, and I think sometimes it might, might be a bit daunting to sort of go in as an established actor to Corrie. Because that's kind of like George Shuttleworth. Um, mm, yeah, Tony Morsley. Tony yeah. Morsley went in, you know, bit of a reputation. Yeah, yeah, I suppose he's a comparable. He's, he's done really well. Yeah, yeah, he has. Compar- comparable to Les Dennis, maybe, where, uh, you know, where he's going into a role that doesn't really suit what people view as his skill set. Because mm. Tony Morsley was in. Um, that com- comedy show. Yeah, Benidorm is in it. And um, this is not, you know, Coronation Street is a, a wide ranging. Yeah. Well, I don't imagine that Ian McKellen, Sir Ian McKellen, gets intimidated by anything. So he was just. No, he was fine. He just lapped it up and was, yeah. it was amazing. Well, the, what, a, what a fantastic mm, thing to have. Talking, How did it come about? That's what I want to know. I know. Talking of the stories with the oldies, um, Emily Bishop actually got some decent stories in this era. And I would say this was the. This was the last of Emily's big stories, wasn't it? Because you got the uh, the Ed Jackson storyline, where the guy who um, shot Ernest Bishop um, sh- shows up on the street after being released from prison, and that was that was that was some of um, Eileen Darbisher's best material, wasn't it? Um, it was very very serious. I mean, he he just comes in and he's uh, he's a nice guy at her church, but um, as as it goes on, there's there's this great confession episode um, where he admits who he is, and and Eileen Derbyshire just you know commands the screen in her in her reaction to everything, and then we didn't see what happened next, but we over the course of the next month, Emily is just battling her demons, and she she wants to forgive this guy for shooting her husband, but. Because you know it's a Christian thing to do, but in her heart she finds it really, really difficult. And um, there was an episode that we did watch, which was a yeah about a month later, where you know she's in church, she's kind of praying for guidance about what to do. Um, then she goes to see Ed at his house. He wants to kill himself because um, he's seen what his behaviour, what his actions, a couple of decades ago, has done to Emily's life. She forgives him partly to to stop him killing himself, um, and then she 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 says, right, I, I I do forgive you. Have have um, Ernest's camera because I want you to go away from here, but I want you to send a photo of yourself using this camera every year, just so I know that you're still alive. alive. And yeah. that really kind of showed that was a real poignant. strength. Of, of, of character for Emily and it was so so poignant it was it was brilliant I've also written a quote here and I can't remember I can't remember what this was talking about but this is an Emily Bishop quote saying I don't know how to go online and even if I did I wouldn't want to she was right <laughs> just, I just found she's hilarious. right so there was that story was was absolutely outstanding and then you got the Ramsey Clegg episode which was a, a series of episodes which was another celebrity guest yeah, I suppose I reckon in, so, a, in yeah. a similar vein to Sir Ian McKellen I don't think he's as well known I suppose it depends how much you like Faulty Towers because I don't know what Andrew Sachs has been in apart from um, Manuel in that but that was really another poignant Emily Bishop story wasn't it yeah because uh, he he shows up one day this really kind of softly spoken um meek and just all round lovely guy and it turns out that he's Norris's brother wasn't he who was what's this I always forget what it said the storyline to him was he was sent over to Australia during the war was he evacuated over there or something his and he broke his mum's heart and Norris blamed him as though he he didn't realise that the mum was sad because she missed him. She kind of, he kind of blamed yeah, and, him for doing it. And Ramsay's come back to Weatherfield after all these many 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 years to try and make up with his he wanted brother. To and, his and, Nor- relationship. Yeah, and Norris is just so cruel and cold, and he's got no interest whatsoever in welcoming this this estranged brother but into the, his life. And the you can- secret was that we didn't know, and nobody else on the show knew that Ramsay had a brain tumour. Yeah. And he was dying. So he, that this is why he came back. He wanted to make up with his brother and um mm. and I don't I, it was so sad. Yeah, cuz Norris is in in his final in Ramsey's final episode, Norris is just an 
absolute ass to him, such isn't a he? Dick. So it's just like because Ramsey's there saying, "Look, come and move in with me. I've got this flat here." And Norris doesn't want to know. Now, whilst all this has been going on, and this is how Emily's linked into it, she's kind of fallen for him a little bit, isn't hasn't she? And so Ramsey decides, like, that I can't stay here if Norris doesn't want to welcome me back into his life. Then I don't want to hang around. And so Emily has to. She she just breaks down in tears. It's utterly heartbreaking as as Ramsey, possibly Emily's last chance at love, um, leaves, um, and then we have the the next episode, or is it the episode after next? I can't remember that Norris gets a phone call to say that Ramsey's died on the plane, and Malcolm Hebden was absolutely knocked it out of the park in that episode as well. Just the regret and the guilt and everything about realizing, oh, my brother was here because he had this terminal illness that he didn't want to tell me about. Emily, another powerhouse performance from Eileen Derbyshire, absolutely livid about how um, Norris had treated him. Um, and then the end of the episode was also so, so poignant because it's got um, Emily listening to Waltzing Matilda the classic Australian. Um, but didn't he leave, didn't he say, I, I, didn't R- Ramsey kind of give her that song or suggest she listens to it or... Maybe, I can't reading remember. reading a letter from him or something? Yeah, she, she, she's reading a letter from him and then the waltzing Matilda is playing and then there's a bit of a musical montage, which usually I hate because it's usually, you know... Cheesy. It, it's usually utterly cheesy, but this was so beautifully done and, and, not, and, and whilst... And it kind of fades out from Emily in number three to Norris going to visit his mother's grave and finding that Ramsay has been visiting there and leaving her a card and everything and flowers and 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 it just dawns on Norris. You know, He's lost this chance. What have I done? Me, and Norris has always been very, um, you know, uppity. Well, and, he always thinks he's, he knows closed book. Yeah, but he thinks he knows the right thing and, you know, he judges everybody mm. on on their morality and he now has kind of got, got to come to terms with the fact that, oh, I've, I've done the wrong thing here. This wasn't yeah. the correct play. No, yeah, that, that was an absolutely amazing story. And another one that was that was great, not for the... You know, the dark dramatic twists, the explosions or, or, or anything like that, but just for some brilliant actors and wonderful dialogue. And it's about relationships, which is what soaps were always about, weren't they? Mm-hmm. Um, what else have we got? Well, we've got Mike with his Alzheimer's. Oh, yes. Have we said goodbye to that Mike was a in big, this era, didn't big we? big story. Yeah. I mean, we had, um, I think we've had the introduction of the Baldwin clan just in the in the last yeah, bulk section, of episodes, yeah. uh, but we got to see a bit more development for the Baldwin's and the eventual exit of them. But um, that was also heartbreaking, wasn't it? Seeing him decline with his Alzheimer's again. We only saw bits and pieces of it, but that Christmas episode was it. Christmas must have been Christmas two thousand and six, I guess, when he's there and he forgets that he's got a brother and. Uh, he, I'm, I'm kind of confusing episodes now, but I'm, con- I'm sort of thinking of one where he's sitting out on the steps just sobbing, and it's just so tragic to see this once confident, cocky um, yeah. uh, entrepreneur, wide boy, being reduced to a, a sobbing, frail old man. Um, and then, obviously, his final episode, where he's out wandering in the night, he turns up on the steps. I thought that was a absolutely perfect death for the yeah. character. Yeah, so this is when he gets... But basically, he dies in in Ken's arms. Yeah. Um, believing that he'd won, and uh, he's like, "Oh, Deirdre's mine, um, Barlow, mm. isn't he?" And and Ken just kind of has to bite his tongue and and let him think that he's won in a, in a way. Yeah, it was uh, everything was just so tragic. That that had another great Emily moment actually. We're in in hospital. Mike, uh, Emily is visiting Mike, um, and he thinks that she's his mum. And it's uh, it just kind of puts a puts a lump in your throat, doesn't it? Seeing you know how how this horrible condition can it's, put it's you into horrific. such decline. Yeah, it's horrific. I, I just, but yeah, having having Ken on the steps was just perfect because of their rivalry over the past you know twenty twenty five years. I know that they had cooled it a little bit after the un, uh, not the underworld the fresh code siege, but um, those two together was just brilliant. I think having I think Danny shows up towards the end, which isn't necessarily needed and I think it was probably the right decision to get rid of the rest of the Baldwins pretty soon after Mike left. Yeah. <laughs> they, 
Uh, they just they, they've never seemed to not fit. needed. Thank you. I, I they, they had a few good stories. Danny Baldwin was quite fun in the factory, but I, I wasn't sad to see them go at the end. But um, yeah, that that's that's kind of how you do a great soap exit. I think again, very very character driven. Um, speaking of great exits, though. Charlie Stubbs and the the end of that saga was was absolutely brilliant. Wasn't well, it? yeah, this was when he was abusing Shelley Unwin, and um, it I, was. I think we'd started to see some of it in yeah. the previous uh, half a decade. I can't remember. So we we more recently have had Yasmin and um, and Jeff, but that was very very psychological. There was I don't think there was any physical violence at all. But um, a similar sort of thing with Charlie. I think I think the thing is about domestic abuse is that people understand, you know, the physical side of things, but the emotional side of things a bit more difficult to really comprehend if you've not been, you know, you haven't experienced it. So Coronation Street tackling those kind of themes. Um, in different storylines is very very important so what charlie used to do was completely undermine shelly's confidence you know make fun of her or yeah and we say uh, that she shouldn't wear this or that and has to lose we also, weight yeah we, we had things that he like organized weigh-ins at the pub didn't he like very public okay shelly get on By the scales her, we bought Let's her a dress see. that she couldn't fit into yeah and yeah. sort of said oh you've got to lose weight so you can fit fit this and ripped her earrings out i don't remember whether this was i think this was probably before this era because this was the sort of time when she ends up leaving him. Mm. Yeah, she, um, she. With there, there are a few kind of very harrowing episodes where she's up, where she's just trapped herself upstairs and she's there covered in bruises and everything. Yeah, I don't, we didn't really. Charlie, did so we see him hit leaving. her? I don't. I can't remember. remember whether we saw. I don't remember exactly. We know that, what I know that she had bruises. Yeah. Yeah, um, we we had um, we, we we had Charlie coaxing. Um, Shelley downstairs one episode and then taking her off to a restaurant, which is just the you know the the cruelest thing to do because he knows that she's she's basically become a bit of an agoraphobe, hasn't she? And then taking her publicly out to this restaurant. Yeah, it's um, basically yeah, just just undermining her confidence in various things and then kind of exposing her to those triggers. Yeah, to yeah. to make her and also that kind of thing would then lead to her relying on him more and more and more. So you take, you break down everything, the support system and the escape um, valves and all those kind of things that someone needs and relies on, and then they only have you. Mm. And that's what he did to her. Yeah, but um, it did then culminate in the the brilliant wedding episode. I think we just saw the second half of it. I think the, the first half had ended when she had jilted him at the altar. She kind of finally gets the courage to say no I won't marry you and the yeah. second half of the episode is very much dedicated to what happens next and having her and I remember this and thinking it was so joyous at the time and it was just as good a second time round kind of striding out of the church Bev there going her mum going yeah you go girl but what I'd forgotten is what happened next because he then doesn't he get her in the car drive her off to some wasteland somewhere she gets out of the car and is striding through the town in her wedding dress she gets to um she, she gets to what I assume is now Weatherfield Precinct. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's we, right. Where you might see later and then, and, in um, the year. And then she just stands... I remember there was a scene where she's standing next to a woman and she's like, says, I, I jilted him, you know, or I dumped him, you know. And the woman's like, yeah, good for you. Yeah, she says, I can do better. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And then she right. comes back to the Rovers where everybody's sort of hanging around because the, cause they, they saw her jilt him, then they disappeared, and so they all kind of... Ref- all the wedding guests retreat to the Rovers where the... um. The buffet is is mm. set up, and she just strides in and takes a big slice of cake I and eats that. it. Like, I love it because she he's been controlling control. what she was eating. For, yeah. for this past year or two. She's years like, I don't care. So. I don't just, care what uh, he thinks anymore. I can the eat cake. cake. Oh was, joy! I loved it. I really, really loved it, and um, it felt like he was absolutely getting his just desserts when yeah, he that's uh, right. when he met his maker at the hands of Tracy. And it, but it was quite a, a while afterwards, wasn't it? Because that the the wedding was. Um, kind of mid to late 2005 but it wasn't until 2007 where Tracy kills him so he stays through a lot of 2007 just being a bit of a um a nasty presence really and he he kind of 
um, he woos Maria for a bit, doesn't he, while he's going out with Tracy Barlow. That led to a great Tracy and Maria fight, which was kind of funny in the street, and Scylla's there leaning out the window saying, yeah, 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 you go on, you go. Um, but yeah, the, the, the death of Charlie episode was absolutely sublime. And um, we, we've not been shy on this podcast about saying how much we enjoy the the, the dark, twisted... Um, episodes like this and uh it was it was amazing the uh you know you got your statue there that we knew watching it or that was what she's going to use to clock him around the head but watching it for a second time you got to see how you know throughout the episode there were lots of the camera framed it so it was very obvious to the audience oh look at this statue what's going to happen with this statue yeah and um i can't remember what it it because obviously leading up to this and we didn't see that Tracy had led everybody to believe that um, Charlie had been abusing her yeah. when really she just found out that he'd been having it off with Maria and she and she and it's utterly despicable isn't it yeah. but because of how cruel and awful Charlie is you kind of can forgive Tracy for it it's and funny, I know lots it? of people still can't it's like um, it's like who's the worst in this relationship because they're both pretty awful mm, mm. and you know it it's a little bit of like how far do you go for justice like how much can you support somebody doing this and lying and framing him for something he hasn't done when you know he kind of already did it to somebody else yeah. it's like such a murky dark grey story and, and poor poor um, gullible Claire is there because she's because she's so caring Claire yeah. Peacock and saying oh Tracy Tracy you're okay and Tracy's acting the victim and everything um, and, and it's all part of her plan and we get to see her doing her sexy dance and turning up the music loud and it was just, it was sickening, wasn't it? Still yeah. clocking him around the head and he's all woozy and he kind of looking up look at, up at her and she, she whacks him again. It was, it was very, it very It was violent. really visceral and um, yeah. it felt very uh, primal, you know, because at that point you knew that she couldn't not, do, not finish him off mm. And she kind of had to steal herself and and force herself to to kill him because. Yeah. And there's also Amy's upstairs, isn't she? I think yeah. there's one point Amy starts to come down and she's like, "No, no, go back upstairs." Oh, creepy. And, and Tracy's there, kind of panicking. What? What do I do now? And she kind of plants the evidence. She puts the statue in his hand, doesn't she? Which yeah. eventually ends up being her undoing. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was. Is it, is it that David who in in court is persuaded? Because he's on a promise with Tracy to, to lie for her and say that he saw it happening and he says, Oh, he's he swung with the other with his right hand, but actually Tracy had put the statue in his left hand or something like that. It was really, really well done and um al- almost as good as the actual death episode was the other uh, two hander between Deirdre and Tracy that that took place um a couple of months later where Tracy reveals to Deirdre yes actually I did plan this all along and and that was brilliant well she had her suspicions didn't she but Tracy confessed to her and just Deirdre realising this girl you know she only had one child she wanted more Ken Ken wouldn't have any more kids with her and so she's put all of her literal eggs in Hmm. one basket and this is the child that she's brought to the world this young beautiful girl that she used to love and cherish who used to listen to tapes and now she's a murderer mm. yeah and, and and that that kind of bit of the story was all about how far a mum would go to protect her daughter yeah and she the, the the truth dawning on Deirdre is brilliant on that episode and but she still in the end says right I've I, did she say I'm going to lie to you in court? I can't remember. I, she I think will she lie agrees to, you. to lie for her. And, then, and we yeah. see the episode where Tracy is in court and Deirdre's calls at the stand and she's just a bag of nerves, she isn't has she? Panic she attack. has a bit of a breakdown. She, she has all these panic attacks. And then she goes and tells the, the lawyer that Tracy did it. Yeah, and, and the, the lawyer's there afterwards telling Tracy how dis, you know, disgusting that she is. Um, but um, Jen ended up, Tracy um, gets sent down for it. Yeah. It, that that was it was amazing, utterly amazing. Yes, it has ruined Tracy in some carrot in some viewers' eyes, but it was I would say it was almost worth it just for the for the the sheer drama that it brought. I uh, very much enjoyed that, and and for characters, I mean, we'd we'd seen the tumultuous relationship between Deirdre and Tracy develop oh, since like you know the mid eighties. So this is a long time coming, and it's. Again, shows you just what soap can do that so many other dramas can't. 
building up these relationships over literal decades to mm-hmm. to, to culminate in, in stories like this. It was just brilliant. So what else happened during that year? I'm trying to remember the big I can't, big storyline. I think it. I think in my head we've kind of gone through well storylines that have really made a big impression on me. There were lots of kind of relationship things that happened. Like um, we had Ken and Deirdre remarrying. We also had Becky and Steve's up and down. Oh my god! Yes, Becky. Can we talk about Becky? We because, can. Because. Um, some sometimes characters that we have got fond memories of, we've we've rewatched and gone, oh, they maybe they weren't quite as good as we thought they were. Like Carla, for example. Carla was always one of your favourite characters, wasn't she? But rewatching yeah. her over this era, I'm, I'm like, struggling to. She's okay. She's alright. She's like you know, she's a powerhouse. She's feisty. She's yeah. You know, there's been some good stuff with Carla. The Tony Gordon story has been all right. Um, there have been some good moments, you know, with the scene with Roy after he had his heart attack and, and he confesses to killing Liam. That that episode actually where um, Liam was knocked down was was pretty good, wasn't it? And, and Tony's there um, with Liam on the floor and he, he's, Tony's saying, oh, the best man won. And so that was okay. But yeah, Carla herself, I don't know whether we've just not seen her at her best. Was it in this, it was in this period as well with Carla that we saw... Um, the uh, the cover up of the death at the factory, haven't we? Uh, Kesha, yeah. the the Polish worker, because there, there's a story where Carla's paying these um, Polish immigrants to work out Outside of hours. Outside of hours, yeah. Um, and that that was actually that was a decent episode where the, the this poor Polish girl or woman uh, falls down the stairs and Carla's. I can't remember whether it's it must be Tony. Was it Tony? I can't remember who convinced Carla to make out that. Or maybe it was, it was or maybe it was Paul Connor, I can't remember. I don't remember, but it is quite interesting to me that some people will never forgive Tracy for murdering Charlie when he was actually a, an abusive piece of crap. Whereas Carla is kind of almost directly responsible She's for the death of a woman who they then cover up yeah. because it would be bad for business if people found out that Yeah, so she they died make out work. that she came in and then died. And then they had to leave her there, didn't they? With this body yeah. on the floor for hours until normal working hours started. That was that was quite good. And we also got to see a little bit of um, Polish Vicky as well, didn't yeah, we? Who I, cool. I liked at the time as a side character. And she was in for, you know, three or four she years was quite, maybe, that wasn't was quite she? quite a long time. I enjoyed watching her. Yeah. She added a bit more diversity to the cast as well. Yeah, I thought she was great. Yeah. But yeah, Car- Carla as a whole, I'm just not... She's just not clicking with me like she always did. But um, Becky, going back to her, she has just been as as amazing as we could have remembered. And I and I think we saw Carla first and I remember thinking, oh, I hope I, hope I still like Becky. But she, you know, she she was amazing. Catherine Kelly, what a what a, a class act she was, and um, just just fun, it's vibrant, fun. There was a scene uh, we watched. I think it was one of the so so it would have been two thousand and nine Christmas time when she's hugging with Amy on the sofa because she's obviously she's married to Steve, and so um, she's just such a lovely fun engaging mother figure to to um amy and she she's really she's um <laughs> she's sometimes um a bit a bit coarse you might say yeah she she gets up to she she goes on drunken uh sprees oh yeah we because we one of the episodes that was good was um well, she, she was dating she, she was jason jason, jason for a bit yeah. wasn't she yeah, i was thinking of that one too and um, she she thinks that she's got it all, and and she and and she's gonna move into this new flat with Jason or something. And she and she's like, oh, I'm, all my life's been rubbish, but now I've finally got a man and a home and everything. But he says, actually, one of the nicest and sweetest things about Becky was that her ambitions were so sort of humdrum and simple. She wanted a husband, she wanted a family, and she wanted a home. Mm. And that's what she really, really wanted in life. It wasn't like she wanted a mansion. She didn't want a hundred children. She didn't want a handsome, you know, rich husband. She just wanted somewhere to belong and a family that loved her. And so because it was such a relatable and um, simple wish, but she struggled so hard to get it. The whole time she was in the show, it really did feel like that was her prime prime directive you know that's what she wanted that's what she was after and she sought it in so many different places with so many different men who weren't right for her and um eventually she she got it in the end didn't she but Mm. just watching her struggle with this 
Yeah. Because she was sweet. She could be horrible. She, she could be very dismissive and flippant and, um, you know... She, she she's, had to, she's one of these who's had to fight for everything. Yes, that's right. So she was ready to fight the whole time. Mm. She was always and when, ready. when Jason tells her, actually, I want to try it again with Sarah, that's when she goes completely off the rails, doesn't she? And, and goes on a, a crime spree, smashing windows and everything. Yeah, see, With a, with she a baseball have, bat, getting totally drunk. Doesn't have good coping strategies. She, do, she doesn't, she doesn't. Because, you know, she's not had... Great role had, models yeah, or anything that's exactly in the past. Right. Or... This is exactly the problem that some people have, isn't it? Yeah. They don't they don't really have perspective and they don't understand how to sort of funnel their emotions into something that's not necessarily constructive, but certainly not as destructive as Becky always was. Becky was so destructive. Even but... when she was happy, I mean that's what she ruined her own wedding, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, when she gets to the, the her first wedding, she's to Steve Pete to Steve, she's getting like she's just drinking throughout the morning and people are sending her booze and everything and then she, by the time she actually gets to the wedding, she's absolutely sozzled. And there are a few drunk Becky scenes. And uh, Catherine Kelly, she plays a great drunk. She is. Oh, just it, to explain the um the scene with the, with the wedding, she, they didn't get married because the registrar wouldn't marry them because she was obviously under the influence. And then she gets arrested. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, she uh, she's just she puts her all into it, and she's so gangly and. Um, That's and right, flopping yeah. all over everywhere yeah. and it's kind of funny in a way but because you know about her background it's also really tragic and that that first one after she goes on a rampage and she gets she I think Steve finds her drunk on the on the floor but in the end she ends up the episode just crying in Roy's arms she can just she was a, a master Catherine Kelly at getting the, the comedy and the tragedy and, and making the audience feel for her. You really, really sympathise with her. She just won you over so easily. Yeah, she was a real, She's real charismatic. great. charismatic. She was a real Corrie great. Such such charisma and charm. I'd, I'd love for her to come back. I don't think that... I don't think she will. But, um, yeah, I, I've enjoyed an awful lot of, of Becky. Uh, who, who are some other kind of new characters that we saw during that time that we haven't talked about yet? Lloyd? was another one. We got to see the birth of Lloyd Mullaney, didn't we? Who's another very solid Corrie character. He had, uh, he kind of, like Eileen, I remember we said this about her when she first came in, really hit the ground running, didn't he? He was, he was great from the get-go, making a big impression. He was, but, but he was also, um, he kind of charms himself into the, into the taxi firm very early on. I think, doesn't he put Sunita's back up at some point and blows smoke in her face in her first episode and then has to try and convince Dev to take him on at the taxi firm? I, I can't remember, but Lloyd was fun. Um, although maybe I wasn't so much of a fan of him dating, um, dating Liz. I've not... Reti- there are a few kind of big Liz scenes that I I planned for us to watch and I was uh, just a little bit let down by them. There was the one where she's hiding behind the, the chair in Steve's no, well, in this Lloyd's is when, flat. Yeah, Steve doesn't know that they're dating so he bursts in to talk about his romantic woes and there Liz is about to leave and she sort of quickly rushes to hide behind the, the sofa mm. and um, Lloyd's trying to get rid of Steve but he wants to get drunk and talk about his feelings yeah. <laughs> and then he sort of sees the keys and he starts to wonder and he, there are some funny lines in there but yeah he sort of wonders if he she's he's got a, a woman in there and mm. yeah it's quite a, I think it's because it's such a long scene yeah but the other one that I was definitely disappointed by I, I thought that one was okay but the one I was really disappointed by was the Liz on the balcony episode which is you know a, another classic Liz episode in the clip shows where she's seeing this bloke and he and doesn't oh, his wife yeah. come home or something and she gets bundled out onto the balcony and and it's all very embarrassing for her that up there in her in her knickers <laughs> yeah. on the balcony. But the actual episode itself they kind of resolved that little problem very quickly and it became it was kind of something of nothing really. We've also we also saw, speaking of Liz, um Vernon Tomlin appearing in this time, didn't we? The uh, yeah. kind of useless Drayman. I, uh, he, I liked was, he was him. likeable. He was see, really likeable chap. I felt bad for him because nobody appreciated him, did they? Because no. he was a bit of, you know, he was kind of a. He didn't realise he was, he was past it, and but he was still wearing his necklace. Yeah, he was like the ageing rocker. With his little sort goatee of. and talking about his band, and nobody cared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell you what, one thing I really liked about Vernon was when he thought that Liz was going off, was fancying. Um, 
I can't remember what his name was, Mason, not Dan Mason, but the but the dad, and he sings that "Don't Fall into the Mason's Arms" song. Oh, he ma- the he performed an entire uh, an original entire, song. Yeah, and it was brilliant. It was so well done. But yeah, I, I you, you know, I don't think Vernon's anyone's favourite character, but I it's I remember shame. thinking I I kind of like Vernon. He was a bit useless, and um, I think I maybe did appreciate him even more this time round just for the, the little that we saw of him. Um, one thing that, what? No, don't go on. If... One thing we got was an invasion of Connors. We did. We talked yeah. about Carl already. Michelle, we've seen. I don't, I mean, we ended up really being, being sick of Michelle in her later years, didn't we? I don't think she was so bad this time. But equally, I don't didn't think really that she enjoy was. Enjoy them. She, uh, she, she wasn't around. fun. She, she was just, she was just there, wasn't she? Very... We saw we saw Ryan Connor as well. We had the whole baby swap story, kind of passed us by quite quickly, really, didn't they? Yeah, we've also had the Windasses. All the Windasses you mentioned earlier, they all came in. Yeah, Eddie and Anna. Anna, Anna was another one that did look quite young um, back in the back in her first appearance, didn't she? Back before um, before Pat Phelan and uh, all the other. It's funny because strifes. In a, in a sense, the Windasses could have been the new Ogdens. Because just like the Ogdens, when they moved in, everybody looked down on them, and they were, you know, the the common, the the mm. sort of the lowest of the low. The um. The Even w- Anna herself was a bit of a. She was a, a she was a, dodgy a shrill, mardy, as as Pat Phelan called her, fishwife. Yeah, but I think she she went on to become a bit more of a, a righteous character, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, they and were a very character, yeah, she wasn't to begin with. They were very us versus them. They were very insular and life had treated them badly so they couldn't see the good in anybody they thought everything was a competition and a way of getting thing you know how can i get how can i get take advantage in this situation like i've been taking advantage of myself mm. but as they kind of grew into the show and i don't think we've got to that stage yet in 2009 not really they kind of mellow out a bit and become a bit more likable and a bit more normal i enjoyed the episode where uh, that we saw where eddie windass uh, pretends to be roy cropper and goes to the cash and carry and gets um celebrated for being the millionth customer or something like that that was quite fun yeah um mary was a new character in this area wasn't she we haven't seen loads of her she was another one that surprised me by how fresh-faced she looked well she also felt very much like i'm coming in and i've got a story and i'm gonna go but i think they loved her so much that they kept it her in it felt like that didn't it because she was very she she latched on to norris she latched on to people she she just didn't let it didn't feel like she knew who she was but she desperately wanted to make friends and she was lonely because she, all she had in her life was her mum and um but she also liked competitions so that's how she came into the mm-hmm. show didn't she because she was the, the competition rival against norris didn't norris kind of fall for her a little bit in the early days and well, then she kind she of fancies was, him but goes too intense for it the joke was that she was norris's lady friend but it turned out she was you know 20 years younger than him yeah and everyone was kind of like, oh my goodness, a bit kind of scandalised and thought thought that she was being taken advantage of somehow by Norris. But actually it turned out that he was the one that was scared of her a bit, like you said. Mm, mm. But I don't yeah, think we got to she seduces him in, his camp, in her camper van one episode, doesn't yeah. she? We, we didn't get to see the um, she made, the Misery episode no. out on the moors. I think that must have been 2010. But that was, that was amazing. Yeah. I was quite surprised when Mary came in. I almost wasn't expecting her to appear that early. I don't know when I thought that Mary came into the show. Well, she's but been in it for a long time. She has, but she she feels like she is more mm. of a modern character, so kind of infiltrating our retro in inverted commas curry episodes felt a bit funny. Um, another another kind of major character along similar lines was Julie Carp, who Aww. we we absolutely loved at the time. Shout I don't out. I don't think we've seen anything like particularly incredible from Julie in the episodes that we watched. No, she very much came in as Factory Girl fifty two. Yeah, we saw her. Um, We've seen her, there was a bit of an episode with her dad. That was a big, that was really no, interesting. No, sorry, who was it? What was the story? It, the story to do with her and um, Eileen and Eileen's mum and how, um, was it Julie? Julie was Julie's... the daughter of Eileen's dad and Eileen's school friend. Oh yeah, that's right. Eileen's dad, Colin, um, seduced... Well... You know, she was a school when girl, she was so fourteen. She, he was he Paula, raped her. Eileen's friend, and then yeah, that's right. And then and she Julie was, was Paula's daughter, and left yeah. and had her baby in secret. And Eileen had knew nothing of this. Mm. And then um, 
and uh, Paul, Paula, who was um, I, uh, Ju- Julie's mother, mm. was seems like a very kind of damaged and narcissistic sort of woman who um, would never really sort of be a mother figure to, to Julie, and she was sorely missing that kind of relationship in her life, and she eventually discovered how badly Paula had been hurt, but she still couldn't really forgive her because Paula just was constantly looking for ways to get on over on on her daughter and kind of she she always thought that life was a competition about who'd been done the worst to. Mm, mm. That that story also did have that Colin Grimshaw character who I I just found very slimy. Who's that? The the, the dad the, the, and then oh, Rita's yeah. going out with him, isn't she? That's right. It? And then she discovers he's a paedophile basically. Yeah. And has to you know, kick into. The and then curve. you've got Eileen. Then he has a stroke, doesn't yeah, he? And, and the, the last things that we saw of him, and is there in his utterly pathetic. Oh, no, no. Eileen and and Eileen, because because um, Julie voice. didn't know. Yeah, he did. Julie didn't know her dad. Then she discovered who he was and why he was a secret to her. And then Eileen had to deal with the fact that this revelation kind of completely changed what she ever thought of of him. And so the pair of them were sort of struggling to negotiate this new relationship they had with each other and also what we're going to do with this man who um, neither of us particularly feel deserves our love but, mm. it, you know, needs to be taken care of because he's suffering from his health problems. It was a really, really interesting and hard story to get on with. It just felt a bit a bit icky to me and a bit... It was I icky. I... You're not supposed to like no, it. No, no, I just, it, it, just, it doesn't doesn't stick with me that story I wouldn't say um, I, I think yeah we've still got the best of Julie to come um, we also new character wise we saw Dirk didn't we <laughs> yeah. we've seen a couple of Dirk scenes Adam Bleece has entered Coronation Street he walked past the street and I think it might have been one of those Colin Grimshaw story scenes and next you're like <gasps> There's Dirk, it's Adam. And I texted Adam saying, is this you? Because he just kind of swooshes past the front yeah, of the scene, doesn't yeah. he? And I say, is this you? And he's like, yeah, that's me. Uh-huh. I mean, and we saw him in the Mr. Gay Weatherfield episode. <laughs> he was having a bomb. hilarious. <laughs> that was a great episode. So I, I've really enjoyed Jason just being a bit of a himbo yeah, so throughout this period. Jason just getting great. drunk and allowing, you know, and getting on stage and pretending he was gay so he could just win a competition for no reason. Like, why? I don't know. He, but it doesn't it, he, it takes a while for the penny to drop the, for him. That that's that, what that he's everybody in. Everybody is gay, yeah. That, Bless in him. this club that he's in. So uh, that, that was fun. Um, Graham Proctor. Now, oh, I love Graham yeah, so much. He was fun. He, he didn't have any big stories that we saw, did he? I think his most memorable storyline was the was the, the fake, was, was the wedding storyline, the fake relationship with Sheen, which we haven't seen yet. But he was just a really solid, fun. There was a lot that, this was kind of like a mini kind of youth, Era. It really was, wasn't it? Because you had him, you had um, Daryl Morton. We can come on to the Mortons in a David. minute. David. David. Amber yes. is in, this, is in so, this time. So now we've got the team gang that kind of feel like they've sort of rejuvenated Corey's kind of youth mm. contingent. But before then, in you know, a decade ago, we had, you know, Graham, David, uh, mm. Daryl, Amber. Um, I... uh, Sarah... Yeah, you yeah. had Candice. You got Rosie as well. They were all Candice goes because I think in this era we did see the Battersby, um, the, the wedding from hell, didn't we? Which is a r- brilliant episode. I absolutely loved it. But everything you know, you remember and you've seen from the clip shows. That's how it was. I thought it was hilarious. I think that the thing about these this group of Candice goes not long after that kind of gang of teens was that they didn't didn't really feel like they had teen oriented stories in the same way that they do now. Yeah, you're right. So they, they were there. They, they existed and they were fun and they got on with each other and they had their own scenes and things, but yeah. it wasn't like, let's tackle the issue that teens are facing now. No, you're absolutely right. That Over the last few years particularly, it has felt like Ian McLeod has been right. We're throwing all our eggs in, you know, at one basket or well, <laughs> we're going to do everything. We're going we to focus a lot on, focus on the sort youth. of making these teen characters work for the teens, whereas I feel like the teens in this era were more you know, appeal to everybody. Yeah, yeah. They, they didn't... I think sometimes the teens now might alienate other viewers who aren't of that age range who don't really understand what they're going through. I don't necessarily feel that way about them myself, but these were kind of, you know, 2009 teens were, like, very family-friendly, 
Mm. You know, anybody who's ever been a teenager could say, I remember when I fancied a lass and she didn't fancy me back. I remember when I had to have a job and I didn't like it and I told him I managed to stick it himself. I I remember when I, whatever. I definitely had a newfound appreciation for Daryl Morton in this He was so cool. Johnny, um, Johnny Dixon is the actor, isn't he? He's just a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, And he was kind of, you know, the character is a bit dopey, but he played off. He wasn't cool. No, you're That's absolutely the thing. They right. Were, bit... I said he was cool, but they, you know, they weren't. They weren't like luxury teens. You know, they weren't like shiny. No, they shiny weren't American. Teens. Yeah, like oh, let's all be polished and we're played by twenty-five year olds yeah. and we all have designer clothes. But he, uh, Johnny, bounces off Jack P. Shepard so well because uh, and they were mates, weren't they? They went to drama school together or something like that, and 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 putting them together with with Graham sometimes as well was just a perfect. Little little melting pot there. I, Brilliant. I, and um, well, she, Mortons then. Um, I I still think they're kind of the black sheep joke family of Coronation Street. But you actually quite liked them, didn't you? I you thought they were fine. The I liked them. Just so many of them. There were a lot, and I kept getting confused about who was who was the mum. Because you got because Jerry lot... Morton, the dad. You got Teresa. Teresa, I think at this point where we reached, is still the only one left on the street. Teresa. Teresa Bryant. came in after didn't the like rest her. of them, and she was the actual mum, wasn't she? Yeah. But there was an older sister for for a while. I was Jody. like, that's the mum, isn't it? She seems quite young to be the mum, but no. It was the oldest daughter. She doesn't stay for long. You got Mel, the one that turns into a police officer. That's right. Yeah. She sta- there was a quite a good scene with her where there was a fight, wasn't there? Yes. Yeah. There, there was an episode that was supposed to be um, highlighting knife crime in Manchester, and that was filmed um, in Media City before it was Media City, I think, wasn't oh. it? I think we said at the time, "Oh, we recognise this," and it was just that kind of area. But yeah, on the whole, uh, the, the Morsons just like me. Well, I like was, Jerry. Story- yeah, Jerry okay. was Jerry right. was played by the actor who used to be in Brookside. Yeah, yeah, and Michael was... something or other. The interesting thing about that family is that they really kind of made the kebab shop into a set, you know, into yes. a sort of yeah. Pre Madonna's roots were were that were that family, and that set has not changed since the nope. Mortons. It's identical. Yeah, since the and Mortons that, which is part created of the problem it. That more of modern Corrie has a little bit, but um, there there was the story that was all right, which was um. Jerry um, being poisoned by Teresa. Yeah, she she, puts, she wants him to depend on her. So yeah, she's... she felt superfluous and uh, she was worried that she'd be mm. muscled out of the family because she re- really she kind of abandoned them and then she came back, didn't she? And they were all getting on yeah. fine without her and she felt insecure and so she poisoned her husband, which I don't recommend. No, th- oh, thanks. But yeah, there, there are a few scenes where he's in hospital and kind of realizing what she's done. He that, that he played quite well. I c- but. It was all right. It was it was all right, but I definitely um, Daryl was far and away the highlight of that family. He was just. Brilliant. I think I like Jerry as well, mm. but definitely I prefer Daryl. Um, one other person who I want to give a shout out to, who's still as as beautiful now as she as she was then, is Martha Fraser, oh, yes. the barge woman of Weatherfield. That was a great story. I can't believe we haven't mentioned that one so far because we've seen um, this this kind of era was Ken and Deirdre coming together, getting married again, wasn't it? And then yeah. Ken straying. <laughs> and the, the, the barge story. We should have mentioned this when we were talking about the Mel Hutchwright um, episodes with the, like, the celebrity cameo character. Yeah. Yeah. But she was in the show for a few months, wasn't she? And we Stephanie saw Beecham. we saw snippets of Stephanie Beach. Beautiful, characters. buttery voiced. Um, you can tell why Ken's head fest. was turned. And she she sort of resided in this perfect world of, you know, a beautiful Bob and her little twilly. <laughs> I don't know if she had a twilly, but she lived on this ridiculously opulent barge and she always making salads and drinking wine and well, we, sitting we by the... the fire and reading poetry and it was just Ken's perfect vision of domestic life wasn't it? This is kind of what Ken's always wanted. Yeah. Well the, the best scene that I remember from the time when we were able to watch it again was her making him this soup from scratch and then you cut to Deirdre where he goes home doesn't he and Deirdre's like oh I get a soup out of a can for you and she's yeah, there she kind of, of like shook, 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 blobbing this, it out and it's like a congealed <laughs> mess onto the pan and it's just kind of making him say oh that I could leave her for Yeah for, I've got I can upgrade myself Martha. here. 
Yeah, but uh, in the end, he decides to stick with Deirdre, doesn't he? And um, I don't know it's, why. It's really it's tragic, <laughs> and she, she's there saying, "Oh, Ken, we're going to sail off and have a beautiful new life together." And she's and... talking about plays, and he's like, "Do you think one day I might be able to be in the play?" And she's like, "Yes, maybe. I don't know." And yeah, yeah she's just um, she's just so cultured and wonderful, and everything he's ever wanted. And then just as he's set to run away with her, he just has a change of heart, and he I don't he kind of says why. his goodbyes on. Uh, um, she wants to be in a street car named Desire doesn't she and yeah. uh... He, he says his goodbyes and then um, I had the notes up a minute ago and I've just lost them now. Sorry, I thought that they, that wasn't the no, right one. No, 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 we, we were nearly there. She um, she just, he, 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 he gets caught leaving by Peter. I think he leaves a note for Deirdre or something and Peter's like saying, well, what, what are you doing? Um, and then oh, yeah. she's she's there t- oh, kind of trilling the... away and talking to him on the boat or thinking she's talking to him and saying well, oh, you, do, you want to, do you want to take the steering wheel maybe you'll get on a boat and, and, Ken, and then the boat pulls off and then she looks round and Ken's there on the bridge behind her he's got off and, and is waving her off and, and yeah she he's standing on the bridge as she the... sails away yeah it was really nicely done but what an arse that one, Ken is one thing I thought was quite interesting was the way that before Ken Ken was preparing to leave and he goes and he sort of does his little a little bit like he did when he was going off to still waters where he he does a little oh, I'm gonna look around to get to soak in the yeah, nostalgia. All some pigeons are flapping. Um he steals a beer mat from the rovers mm. like I'm gonna take this one piece to remind me of my life here and I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna do, be somebody else but in the end he couldn't do it. Mm. Mm. He almost had his head turned by um, Denise as well because she comes back as part of this, doesn't she? Well, not this story, but in this era, he goes because he wants to reconnect with Daniel. So we've got the first kind of appearance of non-baby Daniel Osborne played by a very brown-haired, not at all Rob Mallard-looking kid. And um, yeah, he, he almost ends up with, with Denise there. That was that was okay. But um, this this was definitely a period with Ken still not wanting to settle for Deirdre, even though that she's the best thing that's ever happened to him, you know? Um, and we also, as part of the, the Ken and Deirdre family unit, we also had some more brilliant Blanche moments, didn't we? And, and just at the end of 2009, we didn't see Blanche's final episode, but we kind of we skipped over it, didn't we? We saw on Chiropedia that this was Blanche's last episode and, uh, and we missed it, but Blanche has been... Uh, as brilliant as ever. We mentioned the AA meeting earlier, which was probably a highlight, but she was just, I just, when I, when I think back to her now, she's just kind of sitting at the, at the table at number one. Looking incredulous. Yeah. And I mean, telling Deirdre that she's no better than she should be, basically. Yeah. And it was, it was so nice to be able to see her in the seventies as well, where she came from. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then what, and then Watching she's like her the go all the way that through, we, yeah. that we love. Um, who else? Um, well, what about, what about exits? Who did we say good, Bye to. Do you not want to do returns? We can talk about returns if you want to. I don't know whether we we had a, a, still part of the same story. We had Ray Langton coming back. That was all right, wasn't it? And seeing what a what a sad ending a, a ending he had because he had his brain tumor or something, didn't he? he died in the road. I, I did enjoy seeing there were scenes of him. I can't remember who he was talking to, but they were kind of laughing about what a what a sad loser Ken was. <laughs> and uh, and then and, uh, but then yeah, he dies in the reception doesn't he at Ken and Deirdre's Reading I liked seeing new Nick so Ben Price made his oh, yeah, debut just, just as Nick at the very ago. end of 2009 when he, he turns young. up at the bar he's a he's a businessman he's got an account an expense account he's whining and dining um, Tina Tina McIntyre not knowing that he was dating Nick's half brother David so neither of them knew each other and then they kind of meet up later and uh, <laughs> he's kind of like yeah. hello <laughs> um, that, that was, was that really was funny didn't get to see a lot of him but it was really funny I remember to when, see I remember when Ben Price started and we were thinking he's so old He's he's the actor's ten years older than Nick he doesn't look right at all he doesn't look anything like Adam Rickett or Warren Jackson um, but he, I think Ben Price must have been younger than we are now when he was filming those scenes and he definitely, definitely looked a lot more fresh-faced than the, uh, <laughs> back in 2009. Um, another uh, One return that I was a bit disappointed by, and we only saw a little bit of her, was Jackie Dobbs. Um, this is pink-haired Jackie Dobbs. Yeah. I can't remember what even happens. Kit, Tyrone goes around her house and or was it a house she's, she's a living down. on. Yeah, that's all I remember. Yeah, <laughs> she was just fairly unremarkable, and I remember absolutely loving Jackie back in the day. But I think it was, you know, late nineties Jackie that was 
Your favourite. My favourite era when she was, yeah, when she had her blonde peroxide. We've got Jed Stone coming back and getting stuck in a hamper. Oh yeah, that we've was got Tony quite Gordon. Good. We haven't really talked about Tony Gordon, but he was a major sort of character. He was a proper who, antagonist. Who this was period, introduced yeah. in this period? Um, the evil factory boss, the Lothario, the serial lover, wasn't he? He kind of he latched onto Maria, then killed yeah. We talked Liam. a little bit about the Liam thing earlier. We uh, one scene that we saw recently was when um, he convinces his mate Jimmy to to off Carla, doesn't he? And then yeah. he ch- has a change of mind, but his henchman, Jimmy, is already around the flat. Um, and Carla ends up attacking him and, and Tony convinces her that he's killed Jimmy. Those are some very she dark scenes. She killed him or he killed that him. Sh- that she had killed yeah. him. And she's like, he's like, save yourself. I'll sort this out. And then he's like, Jimmy, get up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought the Tony stuff was okay. It just wasn't amazing for me. Let's talk about people that left this era. We had Vera. Yeah. Sad. Sad. Died. Just died in it. Died it was in very, chair. very low key, wasn't it? They come back from Blackpool. She sends them off to the pub. Jack comes back and finds her there in the chair. And Bill Tarmy was brilliant. Just it, like, oh no, Vera, you've left me. Yeah. Oh, and then oh, him oh, oh, sobbing, oh. like with his hands clasped around his chest, like hugging himself for comfort. And you yeah. see this grown man bereft, you know, left without his partner of mm. his whole life. It was very sad and it was very real and raw and it yeah. felt like the sort of thing that, unfortunately... You know, it's Lots sad to say that if you're through. married, you kind of that's your best kind of outcome, isn't it? Mm. One of you dies in your old age. And she and Vera did go peacefully, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, she was peaceful, she was happy, she sat down and she just left and she probably didn't know she'd gone. Yeah, we, we've um, seen a bit of um, Connie Rathbone as well, haven't we? Which was Jack's... Um, uh, his, his, his new, new, his new companion who um, Tyrone immediately took against oh but I, I liked Connie she was nice we haven't seen very much of her in the, in the rewatch anyway but she was alright we saw but the exit of Blanche but not really because um, she, she just, has not been she's not she been she's exit, not died on the show yet no, she just she just stopped appearing yeah um, Fred, My, Fred's death we saw we haven't talked about him oh this was when on the, the wedding Audrey, yeah, he was getting he was married. He was getting married to Bev Unwin, wasn't he? And um, Audrey went around there to sort of wish him well, and he kind of tried to win her back, and then she mm. she wouldn't. Yeah, he's he's his final line to Audrey is, is "Be happy," and then he goes into the hallway, and we just hear a collapse, and he's I do, and it, there's I've got a very haunting image in my head of Fred lying there with his eyes wide open, yeah, dead on Audrey's uh, hallway in Grasmere Drive. But that that was well done, and it's it was it was sad to say goodbye to to Fred. Um, Martin went. He, he kind of just scurried off towards the beginning of this period. Les d- disappeared off, didn't he? But that was after um, you know, Bruce Jones um, disgraced himself uh, somewhat, in, uh, and, and so his character was unceremoniously written out of the program. Cinna went not long after. That wasn't particularly memorable. She she ends up working at a care home and. Doesn't she get like a load of money from a from an old geezer in the care home? He leaves it her in his will, and she goes off to uh, Las Vegas. But that that wasn't that brilliant an episode, uh, uh, an exit. All the Harrises left in this period towards the beginning. I think the episode where Katie clocks um, Tommy around the head with the, the wrench was a pretty good one, wasn't it? Yeah, that was dramatic. That was very dramatic because he'd. Um, he didn't approve of her relationship with Martin Platt, let's say. Yeah, Martin Martin obviously was uh, Gail's husband. Yeah. Well, father uh, of... Um, he, he'd, he'd split up with Gail by yeah. this point, but so he, he pursues his Shouty relationship nurse. with Gaty, Katie, which we'd seen in the first half of the 2000s, but we saw the where this all led up to in the end. Uh, and I think... I can't remember how it happened. Did um did people suspect that Sally was having an affair with Tommy or something? I can't remember, but yeah, the the, ep- the episode where I think didn't didn't Tommy persuade yeah Tommy persuaded Katie to have an abortion. I'm thinking because he thought that Martin was having an affair with Sally or something. Whatever the case, Katie takes it out on Tommy, and then um she ends up um putting herself into a diabetic coma leaving just Craig, Harris and Angela. Angela takes a rap for it. She goes to prison. Craig hangs around a little bit for Rosie, but then disappears off to Berlin. So it was a bit of a... bit of a Tragic tale. Yeah, a, a quick exit for, for most yeah. of the Harrises. Um, 
that that was that, looking at these exits. I think the main ones, the the big ones, were were definitely Mike and and Charlie Stubbs. We we kind of already talked about. Um, let's. I think. I mean. I think it feels like. You know. We've been going an hour and a half now. It feels like we've run through most of the big things that have happened in this era. Should we just have a little skim through our notes? Well, there was a lot else of things that jump out. There are lots of little bits. Little bits in Bobsy but Boozy bits. Like like but... Joanne and Jesse Jackson were here in in this um in this era, weren't they? The twins who turned out not actually to be sisters, and then one of them gets deported in the end. They were all right. But not at all memorable. Um, what else have we? Well, got? the beginning of the era of that was when you know Katie kill dies of diabetic coma. We got Mel coming in. Diggory, got Diggory Compton, Compton, who is Molly's dad. Can you miss him? Yeah. He's just there making a load of bread puns for his first episode, trying to fit them all in because he knows that his character's only going to be in the show for a few months. But he did not work at all as a character. Mel Hutchwright, at the beginning of the year. This is when he comes in. We've also got. I kind of enjoyed um, the Baldwin mum, Jamie and Leanne, go to visit. Oh, yeah. Um, She's an alcoholic. So this was... She? I can't remember what her name was. was her, who was she married to? Married to... She'd been married what's to her name? Danny. Danny's wife. And she was just a completely sozzled, drunk, cockney mum. Oh, yeah, because we got to find out because Danny went off with the babysitter, didn't he? And that was Frankie. Yeah, so that's Frankie. So, so Frankie what, was who's younger. And behind was his older... And, and she was so bitter and twisted. And there was also yeah. a really fantastic Christmas scene where, where Jamie misses his mum so much he, he invites her to come for Christmas. And she yeah, and really then you've awkward, got Frankie sort of trying to be the bigger person and sort of trying to be magnanimous and allowing her into her home and cooking her food and stuff and she's just there um you know sniping at her and yeah. just being compl- a massive lunt a lush mm. um it wasn't that was it christmas i don't know but yeah, uh, yeah i think it was i think yeah that was um oh yeah yeah she just makes it yeah it, it, she just makes a scene of herself um what else have we got um, the deep fried turkey that was that same year yeah janice getting knits was kind of fun oh ashley's boxing max against uh, match. match against mad dog maddox was Kind of fun. Well, it was like rival bitches, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. With um, and and his rival has also got a silly squeaky voice as well. <laughs> um, well, you, you mentioned um the knit thing, but you didn't mention that she had to shave her head. Yeah, yeah. Vicky Entwistle all really uh went for it, living the role there, living the dream. <laughs> yeah, we had. I'm just. We used to be talking about a lot of the rest of the stuff. Just skimming, skimming, skimming. Um, and I think. I just I think we've talked about most of the the main bits. Um, the, what was going on with the peacocks? We we said we said the but the boxing match. The the peacocks for me being with Claire and Ashley just was a bit of a damp squib. Really, they had a fire, but I didn't really care. Freddie Baby was Freddie missing. Was don't know where he was. By Casey, didn't really care. Got one over. Claire, I always thought was just a bit of a buzzkill like and, and couldn't live up to Maxine. That was the problem. Oh, she I, was I, I she was you, just in Maxine's shadow. No, I I really vibed more with um even on the second viewing more with Claire than Maxine because Maxine mm, was kind of a, a sort of um just very beautiful and I couldn't really relate. <laughs> <laughs> Something I just I, I've noticed from I can't remember we we're in two six or two thousand and seven and I know it's now the um, Angela Hawthorne's funeral um, so the oh uh, this is Norris's good. ex-wife yeah and then um, all of her other ex-husbands turn kind up. of henpecked uh, men yeah they and they kind of form a little club don't they of, that survivors uh, club so, yeah it was and one of the actors there was Paul Copley who went on to play Arthur Medwin. Um, he was Evelyn's, Evelyn's uh, boyfriend. fellow a couple yeah. of years ago, but they, they were quite funny, and they kind of vote Norris to be the leader of their of their little band, and they, and they hung were... around for quite a while. There were a few episodes yeah. later on in the year where just the these three survivors were there together. That was quite fun. We had Jack and Vera's golden anniversary. That was quite sweet. Yeah. We had Haley meeting Christian, which mm. I, you don't like. No, that was the like um, that, that was the retcon fun. kind of thing. Yeah. John yeah. teaching... Um... Oh, yeah, we did have... We, yeah, we had the John Stapes saga, didn't we? A part of it, before he goes completely murderous. <laughs> um, but we had the Christmas knicker gate with, uh, with him and Fizz and Rosie and getting their presents mixed up. That was that was quite a fun episode. It was kind of like how you remembered it, really. I don't think that... I think my favourite John was post... Was, you know, was like the 2010 John where he really gets... 
off desperate the rails. Yep. and then kind of leading up to the tram crash where he offs Charlotte Hoyle. This is why you've got the government's got to be really careful about how they treat teachers. Yeah, yeah, it could happen. You push to any them too of us. far, and uh... <laughs> we had um, Fizz's protest at the prison when John goes gets sent down for um, kidnapping Rosie, didn't we? Yeah. And, and she and she gets married to him there. Um, oh, Sean's story we saw a little bit of, didn't we? Where he, um, he has the baby, or Violet has his son, and then she she disappears Shacks up off with Jamie. To, to London, and well, felt yeah. really bad for Sean, just as he much as he did originally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. These damn heteros. Yeah, I'm just seeing a bit about the tattoos. Yeah, we we've got the note here. David does get his Tina tattoo, and Daryl gets an L. And it's supposed to be the start of England, so it's supposed to turn into a capital E, but he chickens out of it. That was funny. I can't remember <laughs> Why what not? he does Good with it him. in the end. Don't, don't commit yourself to something you're not really mm. sure of, especially when it's going to be permanently on your skin for oh, the rest of your life. Yeah. Oh, we saw lovely gay Ted. Gail's dad appears for the first time, and she kind of struggles to converse with him a little bit about being gay. It's a little bit awkward, so we get, get a bit more development of the Gail and Audrey relationship. Um, anything yeah. else? Peter and John Windass is appearing in 2008. I think, I think, we, oh, Mike Scott's dramatic heart attack. Oh, yeah, this Classic was... Classic um, for Harry Hill TV burp viewers. Uh, uh, Janice's um, sort of bloke that she hooked up with in hospital. He's he only in it for like heart. two episodes. But he was he was so memorable because of how, how silly how his... How overdramatic yeah. his heart attack So they're attack outside was. having a cigarette, aren't they? And uh, he just suddenly dies of a heart attack and yeah. shakes her to the core. Yeah. We had the Doesn't devs, make her stop smoking. We though. had the Dev storyline with his um with his young art Oh, yeah. Dealer. What's her name? Woman, um... I don't remember Tara. Tara, that's right. She yeah. she kind of gets she yeah she's the young, vivacious, ambitious, very posh and upscale girlfriend of Dev, who he constantly is trying to impress by throwing money at her art gallery. Yeah, she, he ends up spurning her. Doesn't he? Does he go off with someone else? I can't remember. Well, she finds out, and he doesn't know that she knows, and so she takes a picture of him naked and blows it up as a, like a giant poster and unveils it like it's supposed to be an art gallery yeah. thing that, that then, was as fun as i would have expected i liked that it because be. she realizes a part way through that this is going to affect amber because it's her dad mm. and amber also knows that dev's going to propose to tara at this event oh, and she's God, excited so she really wants her to be her mum and then tara <laughs> realizes that she's kind of also dumping t- dumping Amber at the same time mm-hmm. as Dev and she sort of says I'm really sorry yeah that episode some things that I found with Blanche during this is there's so many classic Blanche lines that appear in clip shows and sometimes you get to an episode and it's like oh this is where the that one's from like we uh, one of the episodes we saw had um her describing Liz as you being like roots as dark as her soul that kind of thing and then that episode with the picture unveiling for Dev had the um, the scene where she's um, lodging with Peter and she, he's got the thermometer and she says it's rectal don't worry it's been through the dishwasher or, or <laughs> yeah. something it's like oh is that a scene and the, the, yeah that was great um, I think I think we're done I think we've pretty much talked about all the main bits. And, and like I said, the last thing that we saw was the Sally breast cancer reveal, which was very well played by Sally Dinover. And, and um, obviously everyone, what was going on with her in real life mirroring this, it made it all the more poignant. But, um, well, I mean, I don't know if, did we mention it, but I think sometimes Sally we, Dinover has talked you, about you kind of, I know, but you assume that a lot of people listening to this have been watching Coronation Street for as long as we have. And that's not the case. Sally Diviner she she didn't she got given this storyline and then she decided to get checked mm. because of Sally's breast cancer storyline only to discover that she herself had breast cancer yeah. and had to take time off luckily she caught it in time and i i think that she's fully recovered yeah. now with a yeah. very good kind of bill of health but she knew when she filmed that scene yeah, she literally Christmas, just found out that she, that she also, also had, had breast cancer. And so when you watch it now, it's harrowing because mm. you're watching a woman who is sort of pretending to go through the thing she's actually going through. Yeah, it's she, she did horrible. a great job. She did a really good, good she job. She did fantastically, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that was it. That was that was the end of our 50 years of, of Coronation Street. I, I kind of started off this episode thinking, oh, we're going to be so down on this period. It wasn't. It wasn't a golden curry era, but actually, we, there was a there was a lot to love about it, wasn't there? There were some storylines like the Ramsey one, the the Charlie one, um, everything to do with Demon David, which were absolutely fantastic. But 
there were also the mere episodes and I, and I kind of on my notes anybody who's a, a patron and gets our notes will see that sometimes I put like one star next to an episode if it's kind of memorable or two stars if it's really memorable or three stars if it's absolutely fantastic and there were definitely a lot fewer two and three stars in this period than there had been in previous ones um, but there was there was still enough to, to like even if it's not you know, proper, proper vintage classic curry. But I think, as we said at the beginning of the episode, the fact that we had seen it ourselves, we lived through it, it was only, we were only going back 15 years or so, does make it feel not quite so special or, or retro or whatever as some of the earlier episodes, which I am looking forward at some point later this year to being able to go back to and revisit some of the 60s and 70s ones. I'm a, I can't wait to go back and see some of those old ones. But, um... That's I, it, I then. think that is it. That is that is um, 2005 to 2009 Coronation Street. That was our thoughts. I hope you enjoyed um, listening to this and, and and this maybe stirring up some memories of, of old Coronation Street episodes. I think it's only going to really make sense if you if you watch the show and the the problem with these DVD um, discussions, we just flit from story to story, and you kind of you kind of got to have watched you it had to, to be there to get it <laughs> to know what we're talking about. But, but maybe um, if you haven't, maybe if you haven't watched these episodes, it might inspire you to go and sort of hunt them out. Yeah, yeah, and, definitely. And um, you know, a lot of them are available on YouTube. I don't know how long they'll be on YouTube for. There, there was I don't a few know mass YouTube taking how downs. Much ITV the wants them to be on YouTube, but they're there. Unfortunately, until Coronation Street and ITV are going to make every episode available for people that want to pay. Um, for it, that's the only way to watch it, and I really honestly think. Do get the DVDs though; they're absolutely. Watch the DVDs. There's eighty getting. episodes per. Yeah, decade. per box set. Yeah, per decade. So there's so. an awful lot. Uh, there's yeah, a good four hundred episodes there that you can properly buy. Plus, there's a the load streaming on BritBox as well if you, if you've got that. Yeah. So um, there we go. We're finally free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am at least. Michael keeps watching the classics. I am, and I and and they're currently in. I can't remember the two. Yeah, they're 2001 on ITV3 at the moment, so you still got a, a couple of years until we get to this era on ITV3. I also don't but... know when they're going to stop. I'm really intrigued to see when they're going to stop their classic... Um, yeah, and will they, go, will back they go back to where they started, or, or will go they back go back further? further? I don't know. I really I honestly think that, that there's... there's um, appetite to go back to the start mm, but mm. I don't yeah. I don't I'm not involved in let's they let's, don't let me in, they're not they don't involve me in these decisions unfortunately let's park discussion <laughs> of, of the whole thing for for another time but um yeah that, that's it everybody that's I hope it. you what enjoyed you that write us in tell us what, what your in, memories what you think. Blah, blah 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 and we will be back this episode with this weekend with, with more, more episodes yeah. chat. Mm-hmm.